Because the one important thing that I didn't have as a Christian was the proof for what I said. But this Quran confirms that the original Bible did come from God. There's only one God, one way, one message, one prophethood, and one way. La ilaha. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الكريم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم Before I begin this brief introduction I would like to just do some preliminary housekeeping As you may know our dear beloved Sheikh Yusuf Estes has been here in Beirut now, <clears throat> pardon me, since last Thursday. And we will be here until the coming Wednesday, this coming Wednesday. How many of you here tonight have had the opportunity to attend any of his events, either here in Beirut or in other locations uh, in, in Lebanon? Can we see you by raising your hand? MashaAllah ta'ala. So maybe only less than 10%, maybe 5%. Okay, very good. Another question. How many of you have heard how Sheikh Yusuf Estes came to Islam, either online or, alhamdulillah? Now, this is good. This is uh, over 75%. Alhamdulillah. How many of you have ever been to one of Sheikh Yusuf's live lectures anywhere on planet Earth? Because that's as far as he's traveled, all over the Earth. So not too many. So, inshallah ta'ala, you are in for a treat tonight. But I have one very, very important question that I have to ask. Of all of the Muslims who are here, how many of you brought a non-Muslim guest tonight? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Alhamdulillah, eight. Oh, mashallah. Jazakumullah khair. May Allah reward you for your effort. And I point that out because oftentimes we have programs and events like this but we don't bring the people who need to hear the message. We just take benefit from hearing it over and over and over again ourselves, <clears throat> but we don't take the initiative to share what Allah SWT has blessed us with. <clears throat> over the years, I've had the opportunity to travel with Sheikh Youssef throughout many countries on this earth, and everywhere we've traveled, he has been received so graciously and warmly. And I must say that the reception that we have received here in Beirut and throughout Lebanon in the various cities that we, and villages that we have visited has been, it ranks among the top five, if not close to the top, alhamdulillah. But this is a testimony, <laughs> Allahu Akbar. This is a testimony to the spirit of Islam that we find here in Beirut, contrary to what we may hear across the Atlantic Ocean. So we've come a long way to share these few days with you, and I hope that this evening's event will be of benefit to all of you, Muslims and non-Muslims alike. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has given us a very beautiful hadith, Qudsi, wherein he says that Allah Subhanahu Wa tells Jibreel that when Allah loves his slave, he tells the angel Gabriel that I love him, so you also love him. And he commands Jibreel to tell all of the creatures of the skies and the earth to love his slave. And in my time of working with Sheikh Yusuf over the last 12 years, I've come to know him as being one of those who are beloved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless all of us to be among the beloved of Allah. And let us, inshallah ta'ala, take this message from this hall tonight, from this auditorium tonight, to those who are not here. Because this message, the message of Islam, is the most important message and mission that we can be delivering today. The society that we're living in, 
is fraught with many, many problems that they cannot solve. And they're waiting for the solution, which will only come from Islam. So without any further delay, I bring to you our Sheikh of Dawah, Sheikh Yusuf Estes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Allahu Akbar. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sabi ajma'in ashadu ila ilahi illallah wa ashadu muhammadin abduhu wa rasul. Assalamu alaikum. Whoa, you warmed them up just right. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Is there anybody here that doesn't, doesn't speak English, you don't know what I said, just raise your hand. They told us not to get started yet because some people are still coming in. So if you're not here yet, raise your hand. <laughs> One's not here yet. Two not here yet. MashaAllah. And this is supposed to be a university. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Well, first and foremost, I want to tell you a little story and then I'll tell you my story to Islam. Before we came to Lebanon, I was quite apprehensive and I discussed with Sheikh Mutahir whether or not we really should make such a journey. From some of the history, recent history, and some of the events taking place, especially the things we read in the news and hear on the television, I said it's not, it's not a good idea. We're, we have a brand new TV station that we have, we're just all about being, you know, presenting Islam and it's maybe not the best thing to do. Plus, I don't know, maybe they can't speak English over there. You guys speak better English than I do, I'm from Texas. You remember Mr. Bush, right? No, nah, never mind. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> you know, as soon as we arrived and we landed here in Beirut, I was so happy that I was wrong. You know, usually when you're wrong, you don't, you're, are you happy when you're wrong? No. But on this trip, I'm happy I was wrong. Because all of the apprehension, all of the misgivings that we had actually was unfounded. And we found here not only a beautiful land, a beautiful country, lovely food, but some very <laughs> lovely and beautiful people as well. I love you guys. You're great. <laughs> Oftentimes people ask me, how is it that somebody who is a priest or a preacher, a minister or a pastor of the Christian faith could come to Islam? And another question I get is, what first attracted you to Islam? And it happened one time when I was traveling through Houston, I just stopped for Salah and they recognized who I was at the masjid, so they insisted that I give a speech. And they wanted to tell me what the speech has to be. I mean, you're just going to pray and you're going to just tell me what to do. Okay. He said, you're going to tell us what attracted you to Islam. So when I took the microphone, I said, they asked me to tell you what attracted me to Islam. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Now the people that invited me, they went, <laughs> It's not what we expected. But you see, I wasn't looking for a new religion at all. In fact, as a Christian, I felt that I was on the best religion there was. Because all of my life, ever since I was a little boy, I knew there was God. I didn't have any doubt about that. Too many things happened in my life, convinced me again and again and again. Although I don't see God, I don't hear God, but I know God is there. I know, I don't have a doubt about it. Some people, they don't have that. But there are a few, they get this idea from the time they're born and it never leaves them in their whole life. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that every child is born on the fitra of Al-Islam. But then the parents will raise them up to become whatever they become. But in my case, I had parents who were very devout, good religious people, 
My grandparents were religious on both sides of the family, cousins, all of us. So I had no reason to think otherwise. In fact, I was nearly 50 years old, if you can imagine this, and never, I mean, I could have doubted a lot of things about some preachers. I could have doubted a lot of things about some committees that we had, but never doubted the existence of God. There were arguments in the churches about things about Jesus, but nobody ever said he didn't exist. So that wasn't a, a problem. But where the problem comes in is when you see people fighting with each other. That was the real problem that I had. I didn't blame that on Christianity, I blamed it on the people. Our church that I went to was a very big church all across the United States. It used to be called very simply Christian Church. It didn't have any other name. It doesn't exist anymore. But at that time, it was the last church only called Christian Church. In 1953, they split and they formed one called Church of God and another one called Disciples of Christ. Okay? We lived closest to the one called Disciples of Christ, so we would go to that one. After about a year, we came back to where we used to live to visit our friends. Do you know they didn't want us in the church? It was them. My friends, we were young. My friends are treating me like I'm some stranger. Go away, you were those guys. Unfortunately, we see that in all the religions, don't we? Hindus will split. Buddhists have different opinions of each other. It's true. Muslims do it. Christians. Everybody has their own little clique. We're the... Uh, uh, uh. Everybody else, no. Us. <laughs> is, is it true or false? You saw the same thing? It hurts. A child is hurt by this. So when they asked me what most attracted you to Islam, I wasn't attracted to Islam because I, I didn't know much about Islam except from the news. In the beginning, what we knew about Islam or Muslims really wasn't true anyway. It, but it was a lot of hype, a lot of hype, very scary. You don't even want to be close to those kind of people. In fact, it started like this. My father came to me one day and he said, we're going to be doing with a, a business with a man. He's from Egypt. You know Egypt, yeah? Huh? And I was thinking, oh, yeah, not her new. Huh? The pyramids, Abu Hul. That's a funny looking guy. You ever seen this? Whoa. And imagining what kind of business cards, stationery, and pictures, images that we're going to have for this. I said, you know what? This is going to be great. But then he said he's a Muslim. I said, a what? A Muslim? Like on TV? He said, yeah, you would like this guy. I said, no, I won't. He said, you need to meet him. I said, no. He said, you'll meet him. You'll like him. Well, I live in my father's house, and I'm working with my father's business, so I got to do what he says. So he says, you're going to do it? You'll do it. I said, but it has to be my way. He said, what is your way? He said, I have to do it on Sunday. I have to go to him on Sunday, and I have to come straight from the Kenisa, from the church. And when I get to him, you know, I'm going to be wearing what? My salib and kitab muqtas and my cap. Jesus is Lord. Now, We have an expression, you know, in your face, <laughs> like that. <laughs> and I was afraid because I didn't know what I was going to be up against. That's why I want to go on Sunday. That's why I need my book. I need all the protection I can get against the evil one. I'm imagining because I know what he's going to look like. There's no doubt in my mind. He's going to be wearing one of those long white dresses you know, or what they call it. And he's going to have like the big imamo. Lahio. You know, eyebrow goes all the way across. Hey. 
and safe. Big sword. That's what I'm imagining. So this way I need to have my equipment. Okay. Bum bum bum. The Crusaders are back. I <laughs> would But when I saw him, I didn't know it was him. He said, here he is. I said, where? He said, here. This guy's wearing normal clothes. No lecha. No hair. He's bald. <laughs> said, this is a Muslim? I said, yeah. Oh. Well, I get to get to work right now, you know? I have to save him. Do you believe in God? <laughs> said, yes. Hmm. Yeah, but you don't believe in the God of Abraham, do you? He said, oh, yeah. You heard about Abraham? Yes. Oh. Now, hold on. Time out. Listen to this. After I came to Islam, I find out he's a descendant of Ali and Fatima. He is a descendant of what's called Ahlbayt. You probably never heard of that here. This is... <laughs> Maybe you heard of it. <laughs> anyway, and it means Abraham Alisanam is his great great grandfather. I'm asking, do you know your grandfather? <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Ajib. But anyway, he just said yes. I said, do you know about the Bible? Yes. You don't believe in the Bible? Yeah. The Old Testament, yeah. You heard of Moses? Yeah. You believe in Moses? Yes. He's a, he's a prophet. He did miracles. Okay. What about Dawood, David, Suleiman? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, but you don't believe in the precious name of Jesus? He said, yes. What? You believe in Jesus? Yeah. But you don't believe he's the word of God? Yes. Miracle birth? Yes. But you don't believe that he's coming back in the last day? I said, yes. Hmm. This guy's going to be easy. <laughs> oh. Yes. Going to convert this boy. So you see, I wasn't attracted to Islam at all. In fact, I was afraid, and I thought that the best thing I can do is convert Muslims to Christianity. And I told my father about it. My father was an ordained minister. My role was what's called a music minister. I was in charge of music, especially pianos, organs, the written music, because I had piano and organ stores. That's what I did for a living. I volunteer my time with the church and then even give them a free organ or piano because hmm? I'm so righteous and religious. I'm a nice guy, right? Plus, I get all those guys in the front row that have all the money to buy pianos and organs. <laughs> ah, business is business. So don't get an idea that I was some like holy guy. I don't, I don't want you to think that. I'm, I'm, I don't think that that's a good description of me. But I did care. I did care about the people and I cared about the religion. Now, my father told me, leave him alone. We just want to do business. He's a nice person. He's a nice guy. Just leave him alone. I said, yeah, sure. Of course. <laughs> My father said, look, he has his religion, we have our religion, and let him go with that. Later you read in the Quran, Lakum Dinakum. <laughs> <laughs> so we started working together, he and I. The Muslim, his name is Muhammad Abdurrahman. And he you know what is Saidi? Everybody knows Saidi from Upper Egypt. Huh? You heard some jokes? Nope. 
knocked from Saidi. Now, he told me many jokes. So we would travel together, we would visit together, we would talk, and then on a long trip, I would open a manadra with him, debate. And he, he'll take one side, I take the other. <laughs> but he won every time. Because the one important thing that I didn't have as a Christian, the one thing I didn't have was the proof for what I said. This was the problem. I believe it, but with what evidence? How I feel? Yes, I told you that. Since little, I feel it. But what's the evidence you can give to somebody else? That's one thing you can't give is your feelings. You can't give your feelings to somebody. Even you love them very much. Here, I want you to take some of this. Huh? <laughs> it doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. So when we'd have these discussions, and he would bring the proof from various sources, whatever it would be, whatever the topic, well, you can't, <laughs> how are you going to argue with the evidence right in front of you? At one point, I went to another preacher that I knew. And I told him, you know, I'm trying to give this man, well, you, you call it dawah in Arabic, but uh, we were just saying we were trying to call him to Christianity, give him the message. And my preacher friend said, stay away from them. They are terrorists, you know, stay away from these kidnappers and hijackers. Just stay away. He said, no, he's a nice guy. No, this is underneath. He's bad. On the top, forget about it. Really? And he said, whatever you do, don't read their book. <laughs> okay, good tip. This same man, this preacher, had a heart attack. He went to the hospital. I used to go visit him. While I was in the hospital one day visiting him, I met another man who shared the room with him. And that man turned out to be a Catholic priest. When he got out of the hospital, we took him to our house to live with us while he got over his heart attack. On the way to my house, he started telling me about Islam. The Catholic priest was telling me things that the same things the Muslim told me. I said, how do you know so much about Islam? He said, every priest knows other religions, and we had to study Islam. I said, really? Yeah. He said, they believe in one God, they believe in him. I said, yeah, 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 that's it. That's what he told me. I believe about Jesus as a prophet. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's, he said that. He said, but they don't accept Jesus died on the cross for your sins. They say that they have to stand good for their own sins on the day of judgment. Hmm. But actually, listen to this, they are the closest to us of any other religion that's not Christianity. Huh. I'm sure we can get this guy now. Still in my mind, we're going to get this guy. Then it happened that well, the Muslim who lived with us, and now the Catholic priest living with us, and by the way, well, we're not Catholic, we're pro Protestant. I don't know if you know the difference, but... So, I'm thinking ways that we can try to bring a message with some real power behind it. So let us do this. Let us have a time every day where we sit together, you know, like you call halakha. And I'm going to introduce the subject. First subject, let's talk about the Bible. Let's talk about the Bible. So I'm going to bring my Bible, which is called Revised Standard Version of the Bible. There. And it said in it, King James Version has many mistakes. And this is going to correct that. But then my father brought his Bible to the table, which is the King James Version. Oops. But then my wife, she sits there with her Bible from Jimmy Swaggart called Good News for Modern Man. Oops. 
But each of these books is a little bit different from each other and sometimes it doesn't have the same number of verses and sometimes it doesn't have the same meanings and different numbers, etc., etc. It's a problem. And we start arguing. And that's before the Catholic brings his Bible. <laughs> because our Bible has 66 books. Protestant Bible in English has 66 books. But the Catholic Bible, which is older, the Catholic Bible is really where the Protestant Bible came from, has 73 books. And there's another from the Orthodox side that has 78 books. مع افتتاح عامها العشرين منبر الداعيات تطل عليكم بثوبها المتجدد جديدها لهذا العام صناعة الحضارة هو وهي شباب بنات نسمة حرية ربيع الشباب حكايا شبابية منبر الداعيات للكلمة الحرة عنوان So before we can even talk to the Muslim, we're arguing with each other. No, no, my Bible said, no, your Bible, no, 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 this said, no, 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 no. So it became a problem. A big problem. And I realized, oh, 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 oh. Because I'm looking at the Muslim, he's like this. <laughs> so this is not going good for me. In fact, we need to get off this subject. Let me try to turn it around. You know how when you have a debate or argument, you got to think of some way to get out of the pickle you're in. You know, it's like, uh, okay, I got it. So, uh, Mohammed, how many versions of your Koran are there? One. <clears throat> what? <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, uh, one. Well, no, I saw, I know that it's in French, it's in German, it's in English, it's, come on. He said, no, there's only one Quran, those are translations. We still have the original Quran, it's not any difference. There's one Quran, only one. It's in Arabia. If it's not in Arabic, it is not the Quran. Simple as that. And there's not two, three, four versions. But then look at this. He made me feel good. He said, but this Quran confirms that the original Bible did come from God. No problem. So he's not trying to argue. He's not trying to put us down. He said, yes, your original Bible, it did. If you ever find it, you'll find it says what the Quran says. Hmm. Okay, change the subject. Next night, let's start different. Let, forget, leave the books out of the subject. I got another way to go. Let's talk about how you feel when you think about God. Because sometimes I watch a sunset. I see the ocean roll in. And you feel the breeze come off of it. Different times of the day you see in the forest, the mountains. So many beautiful things. And what do you think about? Who made all of this? Who made those clouds? Who made this universe? Who made... Ah! Oh. And you see a baby. When you see a baby, how do you think? Oh, who made this baby? This is, they're so perfect, so beautiful. You ever hold a new baby in your hands? Huh? And those little fingers and little toes. You just want to kiss them. <laughs> I'm serious. So let's talk about God because he's the one that made all that. I have a great idea. So that night, ah, now let's talk about God. Okay. We believe God is one God. He said, yes. You know, while we were sitting at the table talking about God, I mentioned that we as Christians believe in one God. And the first commandment is in the book of Exodus in chapter 20. It's very powerful, speaking to the children of Israel, telling them, 
through Moses actually, telling them, I'm the Lord your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt in the house of bondage. You know no other God beside me. There is no other God beside me. Thou shalt not have any other gods beside me. And the second commandment, like unto it, Thou shalt not make unto me any image of anything that creeps upon the earth, swims in the sea beneath, or flies in the air above. You know, one day I was sitting in my church, listening to the pastor, and I was looking on the front of the podium right here. There was a fish. A fish. Stomach. You know stomach? For the stomach. So here's the... <laughs> These are stupid jokes. <laughs> but if you don't laugh, they'll get worse. <laughs> anyway, there's a fish right here. And I'm looking at that fish, and I got my Bible open to Exodus 20. Not of anything that swims in the sea beneath. Oh. And then I look up at the stained glass window, and you know what they have? A bird. And he has a, like, olive branch. Huh? It's in stained glass. And I look up at that and I said, hmm, it flies in the air above. And then, right behind me, what do you think? They got Jesus on a cross. I said, well, they didn't miss a thing. They got everybody. <laughs> Everything he said, don't do it, they did it. <laughs> huh. But now I'll come back to what happened next. We're talking about this and I'm ex explaining, we believe in God that created everything. He said, well, we do too. There's no difference. That's the God. Regardless, we say Allah, you say Illa, or God, or Dur, or Dios, or Adan. That's one of the names, I think, in Russian. All of it comes down to one God. One God. Great. He said, okay, can I ask a question? At last. Yes. Can you explain Trinity? <clears throat> yeah. Okay. There we go. Well, okay, first of all, God is one. God is one. The Trinity, huh? It's not three gods, okay? Don't get this idea. Trinity is not three gods. Jesus, God, and the Spirit. He said, those are three things. I said, no, no, no. It's all the same thing. He said, how? You said Jesus is the Son. Yep. And God is the Father. Yep. Those are two different ones, right? Yeah. But, uh, but they're the same. <laughs> well, how can the Father be the Son? <laughs> That's a good question. <sighs> so, how do you explain the Trinity? I said, let me get back to you. I went to my preacher friend the next day. I said, you know, I'm, I told him what happened. And uh, about the Trinity, about the Son, the Father, the Spirit, the... He said, I told you, stay away from these guys. <laughs> You're going to get a shaitan. A devil's going to be on you, man. <laughs> That's the problem. He said, beside, did you tell him about the tufa, the apple? Ah, got it. Okay. Next time. <sighs> tufa. This will explain the Trinity. He said, an Apple will explain God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because, okay, you have the red on the outside of the apple, yeah? Okay. The red, the skin, right? Inside is the part you eat, yep, and inside that is the seeds, but these three are one apple. <laughs> he said, how many seeds are in there? And what if you have a dude in there? <laughs> a worm. I like that dude. Because we call everybody dude in America. I can't wait to go back. I'm going to have fun. Hey, dude, what's up? Hey, dude. You guys taught me this one. I love it. This is funny. I can't wait till the next time I... <laughs> well, anyway. So we'll keep going. Anyway, I got stuck. I go back to my preacher the next day. I'm like, hey, you know what he said? How many seeds? And what about a dude? And what about, you know? And he said, 
Oh, I told you, stay away from these guys. Tell them about the babe. Babe. You know, babe. I like boiled eggs, by the way. Do you like boiled eggs? They're good. Put a little salt, pepper. Some fool. That's Egypt, by the way. So, when we get back, I said, okay, like the egg, you have the shell on the outside. You have the white on the inside. And inside of that is the yellow. These three are one egg. What if it's a double yolk? <laughs> What'd you call it? Three. What'd you call it? Huh? Suffering. Your God becomes four. <laughs> Just like that. A square. Now, about this same time, my friend brought the book, the translation of the Quran with Arabic. It's a big one. Back in those days, we had this really big, heavy one, you know. He laid it on top of the counter, and I said, is that your Quran? He said, yeah, go ahead. I said, no. Ho, 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 no, no. But when he left, let me just take a look. I'm going to check it out. There's nothing there. The pages are white. Another white page, another white page. Then some notes. Uh, what is this? What the number on the page is like 700, 800 something. So what is this? They printed their book backwards. <laughs> you have to open this way. Haji. <laughs> well, look what it says. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. So far, so good. I like that. That's nice. All the praise is to God, which is the Rabbil Alameen, most gracious, most merciful, the ruler on the day of judgment. You only do we worship. You only do we turn to for our guidance. Ehdina, guide us to the straight path, Sarat Mustaqim. The path of those that have your nama, your favor, gifts, you know. Not the path of those that have your wrath, radab. And not the path of those who are lost. That's pretty good. I like that. That's nice. Turn the page. Alif Lam Mim. What is that? Oh, I'm reading the book. Oh. Then I remembered. I need to close the book. You know, when I started, when I first opened the book, what I said before I opened it? Oh, God, protect me from any evil while I read this book. How <laughs> would <laughs> By accident, Allah's Qadr. Now, I've got to try one more time. How can I get this Muslim to Christian? One more time. I'm going to give him everything. So, I'm telling him, okay, look. This subject, I know there's God. I feel that there is a God. I, in my head, in my mind, everything, there has to be God. Where did everything come from? An accident? Nobody could believe in evolution. People came from monkeys? Please, how come we still have monkeys? Well, they didn't develop yet? <laughs> and when I look at the things that are here, even one molecule of protein, by accident, to put together the elements to make one molecule of protein, that's life, by the way, protein, life. It is impossible to calculate the possibility of accidentally making one molecule of protein. 
If you didn't know this, you need to check it out because it was a Swiss mathematician who wanted to calculate the possibility of the Big Bang happening. He's an atheist, mullhead. He said the universe is not big enough to calculate the possibility because, although I'm not saying it's impossible, still we can't calculate it. One in how many molecules of protein just in your eye or just in any part of your body. How could all of this come about by accident? An accident happens, you see a mess, right or wrong. Two cars crash together, you don't see a bunch of little bicycles. <laughs> True? If I drop a glass of water and it breaks, it doesn't make little small glasses. If a hurricane goes through a junkyard, picks up the metal, throws it in the air, it falls down a brand new Mercedes. <laughs> full of petrol, already running. You would laugh. If I take you to a restaurant, we go in, you, well, there's nobody works here. Don't worry, sit down. What happens? Boom! Oh! Look at this, cheeseburger. <laughs> All right. Just the way I like it. Yep. Pretty good, huh? And malted milk, boom! Oh, that's nice. Got a milkshake. Wow. And then when you're all done, boom, it disappears. You walk out the door just as you go through the door, it scans your billfold, boom! Takes the money out of your bank account. <laughs> you would laugh, you'd say, these are ridiculous, that's funny! But then somebody says, yeah, but everything we know about came from a big bang. Oh yeah, I can see that because he's wearing a suit and he's a professor and he has degrees. Let me share with you something. There's degrees and then there's degrees. Some people, they have many degrees. Would you like, you're in a university, you want degrees, how many like a degree? Get your hand up quick. Maybe they'll pass them out. Hold them, up. <laughs> I'm gonna share with you a secret. I'll tell you where you can get all the degrees you want in one day. Go to the pharmacy, buy a thermometer. It's loaded with degrees. So now I'm trying to tell my friend how I know there has to be God. He said, this is not our argument. This is not a discussion. I agree with you more than you do. Our Quran gives us the evidence for this. He said, but you know what? Three months, I'm giving him the dower for Christian. You know what he said? I'm ready to go to your religion. If it's better than my religion. Ah, uh, Christianity is easier than Islam. It is. Don't, hey, don't miss this point. It is easier. You don't have to pray five times a day. You don't have to pray one time a day. No, you should, but you don't have to. If you don't pray five times a day, you're not a Muslim yet. Five times, not four and a half. You don't have to fast Ramadan. You can fast as a Christian, but you don't have to. If somebody leaves Ramadan and considers that's not part of Islam, he left Islam with it. You don't have to make a pilgrimage. A lot of Christians like to go and visit Jerusalem. That's a pilgrimage for the Christians. It is. But you don't have to. If Allah makes a way for you to go to Hajj and you don't go, you're going to have to deal with it on the Day of Judgment. And Zakah? Now in Christianity, they will push you. The preacher will push you to pay 10% of your income. He will. He'll make that wajib. But in Islam, you only pay 2.5% of your wealth. And if you don't have any wealth, you don't pay. That was the only attraction that I saw from a materialistic point of view. So I'm saying my religion, Christianity, is better than his religion. It is. Come on. He said he'll be. Hey, <laughs> got it. <laughs> but then he said, I'm not finished. Uh-oh. He said, I will go to your religion, if it's better than my religion, but, wallakin, 
you need proof dalil. Now I'm sure of it. I wasn't sure, now I'm sure. Take a bow. In America, they'll break your legs. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. But when he finished the statement, he said, I will go to your religion if it's better than my religion, but you need proof. And I said, wait a minute. Religion is not about proof. Religion's about faith. He said, in Islam, we have both. We have faith. There are a lot of things we have faith in, but we have proof to back it up. Everything we say can be based on something, contingent on something that is an evidence, that is a proof that you can test to see for yourself. So if you have more proof, I'm ready to go with what you have. Finish. I have nothing after that. What is the proof of Christianity except faith, except feelings, except how you want to interpret one of the versions of the Bible? What is it? But if you look at Islam, the strange thing is it clarifies and makes clear the very things you already believed in as a Christian. Plus, it helps when you go back to the Bible, and I did this, to go back to the Hebrew and go back to the Greek, that we don't have the original Aramaic. As far as I know, it doesn't exist. It might, but I'm, I'm not aware of it. There's one Aramaic Bible in Syria, but it's not original by any stretch of the imagination, but it's very old. Even then, there are uh, strange contradictions between it and the Vulgate of the Catholic Church for Jerome in the fourth century. Now, I don't want to give you a class about all that. I'm just telling you there are so many differences. You can't get resolution. But when you read the Quran, and then you go back, I'm talking about Arabia. When you read the Quran in Arabia and go back over here and look, you'll find, ah, I get it. There's the resolution. So all of a sudden, this word, heos, which is in the Greek, can be understood to be not ibn, not ibn, but what? Abd. Now, if, I think everybody here knows Arabic, right? So you understood what that means. Not son, but? Uh, because it's coming from a word which is Parakletos, no, not Parakletos, that's for, uh, for Muhammad Sassam, the, the heels, is a word that if you look it up in the dictionary, the Maurid for the Hebrew and for the Greek, you're going to find out something. The word is wider, and it carries the meaning of a servant, a slave, a son, a nephew, or even the relationship of a pastor to his sheep. The one who is the shepherd takes care of the sheep. So if you said that, yes, we believe in this, that Jesus is the servant of God, he is the, not Ibn, but Abd of Allah, then exactly we have no problem for all of us. But then when you read, Lam Yalid or Lam Yulad, where is this? Quran? Well, guess what? Read Numbers. Numbers. In the Old Testament, chapter 23, verse 19, God is not a man. God is not the son of man. First time I ever read it. I'd read it, but I never noticed it. And now when I went back to the preacher and said, what about this? He said, you don't understand. That's the Old Testament. God decided to change his mind, and then he became... <laughs> this guy is telling me stuff. And I said, you know, I read the first part of the Quran. He said, that's it, you're finished. You're gone. That's it. Oh. 
افتتاح عامها العشرين منبر الداعيات تطل عليكم بثوبها المتجدد جديدها لهذا العام صناعة الحضارة هو وهي شباب بنات نسمة حرية ربيع الشباب حكايا شبابية منبر الداعيات للكلمة الحرة عنوان So now, when I get back home, I find the Catholic priest, he went to the mosque again, and he was gone all day. And I'm wondering, what happened? What happened? Where is he? And when they came home late at night, I saw the Muslim getting out of the car. I know him. He's got a shiny head. You see that far away. But who's the guy with him? He's wearing all white, like a dress. He's got this cap on his head. Huh? I looked at the priest, I said, did you become a Muslim? Okay, all right, now I had an idea. In my mind, I'm trying to see how can I talk to my father and my wife and use this as a tool to get the point across that, hey, look, a priest went to Islam. What do you think? I'm not going to commit to anything here. I just want to check the water. So I get up. We used to have a television show, so I have a lot of equipment, bigger than this stuff, because back then it was huge stuff. Drag it out, set up the tripod, lighting, microphones, everything. Took over an hour to get ready. And by then, the Catholic priest is asleep in the chair. I want to ask him the question you asked me. That's why I'm here. How did you come to Islam? How does a priest, a preacher, a pastor, a music minister, how do they go to Islam? That's what I wanted to ask him. And he fell asleep. So I went back upstairs to where I lived. And I'm trying to just tell my wife about it. Maybe she'll, you know, get the idea. I say, yeah, Catholic priest except the Islam. You know, what do you think about that? And, you know, and so, and then she said, I want to get a divorce. Talak. Huh? She said, all this talking about religion and converting, it convinces me that you and I can't be married anymore. Finish. I said, why? She said, yes, a Muslim cannot be married to a Christian. There's no way. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I did, did not. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I did not say that I wanted to be a Muslim. Did you think me? I'm talking about him. Just, I'm curious. Yes, uh, there's, you know, and besides, he, meaning Muhammad, Abdurrahman, he told us that a Christian woman could be married to a Muslim man. No, I don't want to be one. Don't get me wrong. But it could be. But that a Christian man shouldn't be married to a Muslim woman. She said, that's what I'm talking about. I want to be a Muslim. Okay, okay, okay. It came in my mind, this is your chance. It's your chance. Do it. I said, okay. Guess what? Good news. I too want to be a Muslim. Wait. She didn't buy it. <laughs> she said, you're a liar. Auntie Kevin. I said, what? She said, because you're lying right now or you were lying five minutes ago when you said you didn't want to be a Muslim. Either way, you're a liar. Now get out. <laughs> I was halfway down the steps of my father's house and I realized I just got thrown out of my own father's house. <laughs> Why do they call women the weaker sex? <laughs> somebody once told me, this is a separate subject, somebody once told me 
that a man chases a woman until she catches him. <laughs> and her first baby is her husband. Strange stuff. So I was in a kind of a mixed up condition. I woke up the Muslim, I said, you and me, we gotta talk, we gotta talk. He said, what's the matter? I said, well, let's go outside. So we are talking and walking all night. Well, he's walking, I'm talking. I want to get it all out about my father. What's going to happen? I mean, I'm thinking about Islam. I, I don't know. It looks, it looks decent. This three months of listening to this, it makes sense. But how can I deal with my father? And what about my wife? Well, she says she wants... I, and then what about the people at work, at the store? What am I going to do about the church? Oh my God, when I walk in there and tell them, hey, you want to be a Muslim? <laughs> Finally, he said it like this. This is not about you and your father, you and your wife, you and your business relations, you and your church. It's about you and him. That's what it's about. So you need to go talk to him. And he walked away from me. It left me standing. I went out behind my father's house, found a place to put my head down on the ground, because I like that. By the way, the head on the ground, I like it. Because when you do this, it's like you're totally giving up to him. Totally. And with my head on the ground, I said these words. Oh God, guide me. I didn't say anything else. That's it. You say it how many times? 17 times a day. If you pray five times a day, minimum, 17 times. When I raised up my head from the ground, I knew the problem. The problem wasn't outside. The problem was inside. You cannot tell God what his religion is. You don't make it up to what feels good to you. You don't take some, leave some. It's not a buffet. And about that, Allah said, in Adina, in the Lahim, Islam, chapter 3, verse 19 of the Quran. Then again, Allah goes deeper on this subject. In the same surah, this is Al-Imran, and in verse 85, That if anybody wants a religion other than Allah's way, go ahead, but he's not going to accept it. And in the next life, they'll be with the losers. I don't want to be a loser. I don't want to make up a religion. And I don't want to take from somebody who has no proof. It became clear. Now it's not a matter of how I feel. It's a matter of what I see in front of my own eyes. There is only one God, one way, one message, one prophethood, and one way. La ilaha illallah. So I went in, I made a shower, I came down in front of Muhammad from Minya, Saidi, in front of him and the ex Catholic priest, now Muslim, I said these words Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu an Muhammadin abduhu wa rasuhu. And then after that, my wife came down. She had a scarf on her head. And she entered Islam the same way. A few weeks later, while I was talking with my father, he also said, there's only one God, and Muhammad's his messenger. My daughters, we took them out of the Christian church school and put them in the Muslim school. Today they're grown. They have their own daughters, their own children. And subhanAllah, I've seen so many priests, a bishop, pastors, ministers come into Islam, not for the snappy dress, okay? And not so they could learn to make bombs, but so that they could get closer to the real Jesus, the real Muhammad, and the real God in the next life. 
That's what we want. We want to be close to God. We want to go to paradise. And we wish all the people knew this beautiful message. The message of the deen al-haq. The message of la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And we ask Allah to give this hidayah guidance to all of us. Amen. Alhamdulillah, in the last 20 years, I realized that the problem is not Islam. There is no problem with Islam. The problem is with us, us Muslims. That's where the problem is. It is very difficult for people to see Islam because they don't see it in us. At the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, People could look to him and see the example of the Qur'an walking. They could see in him the beautiful akhlaq, the character, the behavior of a good righteous person. And they could see in the Sahabi, the companions of Muhammad Wasallam, this example of honesty, integrity, of being truthful to everything they said, of being serious and being very concerned and compassionate for every human being and every living thing. They lived a life that was exemplary of what Islam really teaches. Today, because there are one and a half billion of us, we think we're something special. But in fact, if you melted all of us down together and put us in one glass, it wouldn't even equal one of the companions of the Prophet So I'm asking, I'm asking all of us to be more aware of who Muhammad really was what his message was, and let's see what we can do to be better examples of Islam. This is my serious dua. This is my reason for traveling around the world. It's my reason for spending my entire life and resources just to get the message out. And whoever is blowing up people, whoever is calling for wars, and whoever is calling for killing and mass destruction, I don't care what religion they say they're in, as far as Islam is concerned, it says clearly, whoever takes one innocent life is though they killed all of mankind. But whoever saves one innocent life, like you saved all of mankind. There can be no doubt. This is in Quran in Surah Maida. I really hope we learn some good lessons. How to be patient, how to be tolerant, and then maybe it is a law who will give us the tawfiq. Maybe. Because didn't he say in the Quran, and he's the one who give us our condition. Only Allah give us this condition. And he won't change this condition until we change ourselves. May Allah change all of us for the better. Amen. We have today over 2,200 websites for Islam on the internet. And we encourage Muslims only to go to positive websites. Do not go to websites that attack the Quran, attack Muhammad, attack Allah, because all you're doing is helping their status be raised up. You're actually committing an evil act every time you click on anything that attacks Islam. You don't need to read it. What do you think is going to happen by you reading it? You're not going to answer these people. You're going to answer to Allah for what you're doing. Stop promoting shirk and kufr. Promote Islam. Click on the links that lead to something good. And if you're not sure where to find it, I will give you the big links. It's called links to islam.com. Many of my websites are listed right there. Nothing bad, only good. You like YouTube? We have Tube Islam. You like to watch TV? We have guideus.tv you can watch it over here 24 hours a day, even on your iPhone. We have it set up for you. If you live in America, United States, or Canada, you can watch it on three different satellite channels. We're there. We've got it. We want the support of every Muslim. How? From your dua, sincere dua, and also from you telling other people. Share this message. Tell everybody how we have this ready for them to see. It's in English, 
but we also are developing other languages. Um, I think we have 27 languages we have finished and about 20 more that we're working on now. So help us by working forward and in a good way, in a good spirit with everybody, insha'Allah. Jazakum Allahu khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Now it's time for a uh, question and answer session. It's not working. I don't think this one's working. This one's but it looks good. Okay. Uh, it's now time for the question and answer session. So our sheikh would like to answer the questions you had for him during the lecture. Okay. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam rasulullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. We've been having a little bit of fun here tonight, and we'd like to continue enjoying our company together in these few minutes that we have left tonight. Because we never know when we're going to see someone again. Uh, when we have a chance to do something for the sake of Allah and have a good time at the same time, this is like a big bonus on top of a bonus. So I'm enjoying being with you. I hope, inshallah, you'll get benefit tonight. One of the things that we'll do, if you like, will be a little bit different. You like to be different? Hey, you're a Muslim, you gotta be different. <laughs> All right? All right. Instead of doing questions and answers, I have another idea. Let's do answers and questions. <laughs> no, I'm serious. We have a TV show called Jeopardy in the United States. What it is, you guys give us the answers and we guess what the question was. I like that one. <laughs> Go ahead, give the answer. Uh, I love Islam. He loves Islam. That's working out good. Anything else? We, we love the Islam. That's the answer? You have to give us the answer. What's the answer? You guys are not used to this. Let's go the other way. All right. No, that's a question. <laughs> oh, you gave him an answer to his question. You don't need us. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, we'll start with this one. <clears throat> Hold on. Okay. <laughs> Where'd you get those? <laughs> really see to them? All right. Now, what's up? Yo. Sheikh, why do you look so cute on TV? What part of the room did this come from? <laughs> oh, I had it upside down. Oh, okay. uh, actually, <laughs> the question, the question is about Lechia. Lechia. What is Lechia? Beer? Oh, stop for a while. Beard. Ah, the beard. Uh, wants to know Do Muslims. Sheikh, you can read that. What does it say? Do all Muslims have to wear a beard? Do all Muslims have to wear a beard? Actually, no. Not the girls. <laughs> I mean, seriously, Sheikh, don't you hate it when a girl's beard is longer than yours? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Let's take the next one. What about the hijab? Do all Muslims... Do all Muslims... Do all Muslim women have to wear hijab? Do all the Muslims wear hijab? Not the boys. But actually, 
Do all the Muslim girls have to wear hijab? Do the Muslim girls have to wear hijab? No. 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 The Dalil is Quran or Kareem. In Quran, Allah tells you in Surah An-Nur, chapter 24, verse 31, and in Surah Ahzab, chapter 33, verse 59, clearly, clearly telling you that in front of her father, she doesn't need it. In front of her brother, she doesn't need it. In front of her uncle, she doesn't need it. And, and, and so many, she doesn't need it. And then in Surah Ahzab, it says, when she goes out, when she goes out to wear the jilbab, the covering over everything, yes or no? So she doesn't need a job if she stays home. <laughs> yes or no? Now wait, the two subjects that we just made fun of, let me show you something that's amazing about the reality. First of all, let us continue the hijab. In the Catholic Church, Sheikh was in the Catholic Church, he was an altar boy, and on his way to priesthood, when he came into Islam in the 1970s. He will tell you that a nun, the best women in the Catholic Church are called what? Nun. Nun, right? Can they get married? None. Can they have children? None. Can they have any fun? I don't know. <laughs> but in the Catholic Church, it is mandatory, at least until the last century, for 2,000 years, the nuns, when they go into the convent, they have to start wearing something called habit. And it does become a habit for them to do this because from the time they wake up until the time they go to sleep, even in a convent where there's only women, they have to wear their whole entire covering. And some of them in the centuries past used to cover the face. They did, I have pictures. Now, for our ladies, the best of the best of our ladies, never have to wear hijab except if other men can see them who don't have any business looking at their bodies or their hair. That's the only condition, yes or no. If she doesn't wear it, it doesn't mean she's not a Muslim. If she doesn't wear hijab, it doesn't mean she's not a Muslim. It means she's in trouble. It means her family's in trouble. Her father, her brother, her son, her husband, all of them are in trouble with the law. But it doesn't mean she's not a Muslim. If she prays five times a day, she's a Muslim. But by the way, when she prays, she has to wear hijab, doesn't she? So let's encourage our ladies to do the right thing, to believe in the law, to establish the salah, and of course they'll have to wear hijab in the salah, and then as they can, as they can adjust, help them, and buy nice things for them to wear, so they look nice when they go out, because ladies like to look nice. Not flashy stuff, no lights blinking, okay, we don't need that. Let's go to the left here. Did not say grow your beard. He said leave it alone. That's what he said. So for the one who thinks he's growing his beard, but he just shaves this part, this part, that part, that, and leave a bit, then he did not obey Allah and his messenger. You leave it alone. That's what he said. Leave it and cut this. Leave it and cut this. That's it. And this is the part where you clap, remember? <laughs> yeah.
what I'm trying to do is show you the reality of what Islam really teaches us. It's not a difficult religion. It's very simple. You don't have to buy a razor. You don't have to go and shave yourself and cut yourself and put toilet paper on your face where you cut yourself. You just leave it alone. And he said in another hadith, give your beard its rights. You put olive oil in it. Do you know that? How many of you know that making wudu includes the lehya? Do you know that? It includes it. But when you read the books that we make for new Muslims, it never mentions it. But in the Sunnah, it's clear, and it is taught by the Sahabi, when you make wudu, you take a double handful of water and put it under and come up through the lehya. How are you going to do that when there's nothing there? How? So it means you did not complete the sunnah. Alhamdulillah, you still completed your wudu. But think about it. Now, let me tell you what happens though. We're human beings, we have problems. I was in Mississippi, some doctors, 14 doctors in this little masala. And after I told them this, their wives are there in another room, and they said, oh, Sheikh, make dua for us, we'll grow a beard. I said, I can't, I'll make dua, Allah will make you stop cutting it off. <laughs> and then one of them, he said, Sheikh, my wife, she wants me to have, you know, smooth face. I said, I gotta wonder, I wonder about a woman who wants her husband to look like another woman. Look who's clapping, the ladies. <laughs> ladies, do you like to see the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu on your men, yes or no? Yeah. What are you doing, guys? <laughs> By the way, they never invited me back to that masjid. I don't know why. افتتاح عامها العشرين منبر الداعيات تطل عليكم بثوبها المتجدد جديدها لهذا العام صناعة الحضارة هو وهي شباب بنات نسمة حرية ربيع الشباب حكايا شبابية منبر الداعيات للكلمة الحرة عنوان Okay, let's go to the next question. Oh, here we go. Oh, that's a good one. There's nothing here. Oh, it's upside down. Ah, what is this with the upside down stuff? Okay, somebody said, what do you wish for your father? The thing I wished for my father more than anything was he would enter Islam and he did, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. That was, alhamdulillah. <laughs> somebody, I guess you've heard our audio, I did this one a long time ago, many years ago. It's the story of the word sword in the Bible. Who wrote this? Who wrote this one? You, wrote, you, you heard it before, didn't you? I know, because you mentioned the spaghetti. All right. This is related to terrorism, jihad, and Islam spread by the sword. You've heard that, right? We all heard Islam spread by the sword. Two points, two points I want you to listen to. Number one, the word Islam, Aslama, has five English words that are clear and some others that are related. But number one is surrender. Surrender. Do this. Put your hands up. Yeah, now you're ready to go through airport security. <laughs> then submission. To submit to whatever, whatever Allah commands you submit. I submit. I'll do it. 
Obey. You're going to obey. You said you would do it, now you have to do it. Then the fourth word is sincerity. Can you force somebody to have a class? Can you? If you force them, it's not sincerity. So there's no way anybody could be forced into real Islam. Not with a sword, not with an AK-47, or a bunch of dynamite, or bombs. You cannot force people to Islam. Allah does not want them. The only way you come to Islam, you have to ask Allah to guide you. That's it. The only way is to ask Allah. So Islam cannot spread by the sword. La ikraha fiddin. You already knew that. So these people are lying. And then I looked into the Quran because I was told the Quran is full of stories of swords and killing people. And I said, oh, really? Let me read it. Do you know I looked through the entire Bible and saw how many times is the word sword in the Bible. Do you know how many? The Old Testament is bigger than the New Testament. You have uh, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, total 66 in the Protestant Bible. And we already talked about the other Bibles that have more books. But in the Old Testament, which is bigger, you have the word sword less times than you do in the New Testament. So many words, sword, 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 sword. Listen to this. The quote that is in the Bible that said, Jesus said to the people, do not think I came with peace. I did not come with peace. I came with a sword. It says it in the New Testament. This is not a joke. So I went... And that's why he's asking me to mention this to you. I went and asked about this subject. And look what the preacher, look what he said. He said, no, 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 this misunderstanding, misunderstanding. I said, no, it's right there. No, 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 you misunderstand. He said, you know, in the old days when the manuscript gets old, the, the, the priest has to copy it, right? And where's the Roman Catholic Church? Huh? Italy, in Rome, yes? Okay, and they stay up late at night and they're working in the candlelight, it's hard to see. And what do they eat in Italy? Spaghetti. They eat spaghetti. Everybody knows that. And so probably, you know what happened? He was probably eating and he didn't notice it. Some piece of spaghetti fell down on the manuscript. Like, made like an S shape. It, no, it was, it was not sword, it was word. It said word. He came with a word. The word of God, the word of peace, the word of salvation, it was word. That's spaghetti on there. You know what the problem is? It wasn't English. <laughs> Oops. It was Latin. Oops. But you see, that's what I was talking about. Whenever somebody wants to believe something, no matter how much proof you bring, they're not going to believe. And Allah said, whether you warn them or warn them not, now you've been known. They're not going to believe. So that's the story of that. Next question. You got any questions over there? Share some questions. What do you got? You're asking about the connection between you and God. Connection between you and God. Well, first of all, is there God? Or did everything come about by an accident? If you go for the accident thing, uh, I have a website for you called scienceislam.com. Go there and see what atheist scientists said about the Quran, and then see if you still think about the accident. Very heavy duty stuff to prove. Without doubt, there is the makhluk, there is al khalik there is the creation and there is the creator, no doubt. All right. But the next thing is, if there is a law, how do you know if you have a connection to a law? Well, from the time you're born, the connection is open. It's up to you to initiate it. Because the law is not going to force you. La ikraha fadeen. 
If you want to have a relationship with him, ask him. Then, after you ask him, he will guide you. If you're sincere and honest, he will guide you to what he wants you to have. Make sense? And what will it be? You want to have a connection. How many people have direct connect? You have a cell phone? Do you have a, some cell phone or, huh? You have one? Nobody has a cell phone? Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. You know how it works. You got a battery, you got a connection, you pay for them, and it's something like that, yeah? What is that called in Arabic? No, nice try. Silla. What does that mean, Silla? Connect. Connect. What's another word in Arabic that sounds like that? Salah. Salah. You want to connect to Allah? Do Salah. How many times a day? No limit. No, that's a minimum. There's no limit. Have a good time. Connect. Nobody said you couldn't do more than five. Free. Oh, and the battery will not go dead. No drop calls. Huh? And you don't have to buy the next version every time it comes out. You just make new wudu and you got the new version. That's your connection. How do we defend Islam when they say Muslims are sexists? Well, first of all, let's look at this. Islam makes a difference between men and women. <gasps> Islam did not say men and women are the same. <gasps> men and women are not equal. <gasps> they are not. In front of Allah, we're all equal because Allah looks only to the heart, yes or no? But in front of each other, we're not equal. I don't look like him, he doesn't look like me, he doesn't look, well, <laughs> leave him alone. What I'm saying is, all of us look different, don't we? And all of us act different, don't we? So we're not really equal. Even in communism, everybody's not really equal, are they? No. You have everybody that's equal, and then you have the other guys that are more equal over them. And then you have the most equal guy on the top. That's communism. That's why Dr. Bilal Phillips left it. Let us come back to the subject of being sexist. If you said, how do you defend Muslims that are sexist, I don't defend them. I criticize them. That's wrong. Islam did not say that men are better than women. It says they're different. I didn't say women are better than men. It said they're different. Look at the basics of Islam. Will you look at the basic with me? Okay, first and foremost, anybody wants to be a Muslim, there are five things they have to do, yes or no? Six things you have to believe. All Muslims have to believe in Allah, wa malaikati, wa katubihi, wa rasuli, wa yawma akar, wa qadratullah. Naam? Sir? Okay. So that's not different, male or female. But the actions, the pillars of Islam, let's look. Every single Muslim has to say shahada in front of the people at least once in their life, yes or no? They have to say shahada. Same for men, same for women, yes or no? Okay. Salah. Every Muslim has to do how what? Salawat al-Khams, five times a day, yes or no? Huh? Every day, yes or no? 30 days every month, right? Wrong. Not the ladies. Ah. Why? Because there's a difference. So Allah knows what He created. And look at this, guys. Look at this. You will be jealous when I tell you something. You pray five times a day, every day of the month. You have to. But you don't know if Allah accepts one half, one third, one fourth, one fifth, one sixth, one seventh, one eighth, that's in Hadith. You don't know that. But every woman knows that in her monthly cycle, Allah is accepting five 
Salawat for her every single day. Would you like to change that, ladies? No. So it's not equal. I don't want it to be equal. You don't want it to be equal. Because you men, us, we cannot go through what they have to go through every month. Huh? We say they ha a lady's having her time of the month. And they look at us and say, they're always like that. <laughs> Think about it. Let's go to the next one. Zakah. Is the zakah the same for the rich, the poor? No, the poor he doesn't have to pay because he doesn't have money to pay zakah. But if he's rich, he has to pay. What you have for one year, you pay two and a half percent. It's different for crops, things like that, watered by nature, watered by, uh, you know, the uh, irrigation, things like that. But it's the same if a woman owns it or a man owns it. There's no difference. Yes or no? Absolutely. Okay, go to the next one. Fasting Ramadan. Everybody has to fast Ramadan? Yes. Every day. No, not the ladies. She doesn't pray and she doesn't fast during that time. And she doesn't make up the prayers. They count. She makes up the days when she's ready. Could be in a nice, comfortable time of the year. We don't get that. You ladies want to change that? No. You happy with the law? Yeah. Good, I hope he's happy with you. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. Hajj. Every Muslim have to do Hajj. Yes or no? Yes. No exception. Unless, unless she does not have mahram. No mahram, no Hajj. No mahram, no Hajj. This is from Rasul Islam. No mahram, no hajj. Don't go do it. Why? Because if you don't do hajj, because of no mahram, you automatically get hajj mabrur, accepted by Allah. No problem. <laughs> but if you go to make hajj without a mahram, there's a good chance you've got itham and you ruined your good hajj. So Allah gave you something better. Now, Men and women are not equal, but, but, we are the same in front of Allah in what? In your good deeds, in your ikhlas. We all need that. So Allah makes it easy for the ladies, and he makes men go to work and support the ladies. Women, if you have any money, huh? Maybe you have money. And you marry this guy, he doesn't have any money. So he said, can we use your money and I don't have to work? Huh? No way. Get a job. Right or wrong? If you have a lot of money, and you're married to some guy, and he's having a hard time, you can give him money, but it counts for you, sadaka. Even it's your husband, you know that? You get rewarded. Tell her she might give you some, I don't know. <laughs> it could work. Cry. <laughs> Allah will give you a reward. So any Muslim that's a sexist, what you're talking about here, is stupid. He's stupid. Whether male or female. Because Allah made everything clear for us. And the more you understand about it, the more you love Islam. Because it's fair. And you don't say equal, you say equity. You don't want to be equal. What lady really wants to drive a truck and have to stop and do salah while she's driving her truck and cover up her tattoos so she can go out there? What is, uh, what is that? No. No. Come on. And the same for men. You know? Men are men, women are women, and come on, guys, it works out really good like that, trust me. So they asked me to mention something some of our brothers said. 
to mention that we have some brothers that are not married. Would you brothers that are not married raise your hands? Way up. You raise two hands. <laughs> two hands. There's one of my guys with me is raising his hand. Here's the guy, he's not giving up. He kept his hand up. I don't care about these guys. That's a look of desperation, man. And ladies, no, no, don't raise your hand. <laughs> you had your chance. You saw what the choice is here. <laughs> On the uh, we have some other questions. It says, "What's the reason behind the hate of the West toward Muslims?" Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's us. That's the reason because we as Muslims have not represented true Islam and number two we have not gone to the trouble to show them true Islam we haven't spent time for the Dawah we haven't worked on our own selves so what they're seeing and what they're hearing is all bad people are shocked in my country when I tell them what real Islam is about uh, you'd be surprised how many priests and preachers I talk to and they say you know this is what real Christianity is supposed to be I said, yeah, we're supposed to be close. We're supposed to be close. Because if Jesus is real, a real human being that we know in Islam, he preached the message that said to love your God, your Lord, with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength and love your brother as yourself. That's in the book of Mark, chapter 12, verse 29. That's in Islam, clearly from the Quran and the Hadith again and again believing in one God and then being a servant of God and a servant to the people. If you can't serve the people, if you cannot say thank you to the people, you don't thank Allah. That's Hadith of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the problem is not the people of the West. They are reacting, that's all. They don't know. And the more I try to tell them, they become shocked. They say, that's not true. Everything I learned on the internet, and <laughs> say on the internet, what a great source. You're reading Wikipedia and shake Google. The important thing for us is to work on showing the right character. Because if we demonstrate the character of Muhammad Sallallahu the people have to be convinced by this character. MashaAllah, I want to be like that person. But who would like to be such a person when they see us doing the same things they do, only maybe worse? And who would bother when the only information they get is coming from non-Muslims attacking Islam. And from some Christians that I know, they lie horrible about Islam. But on the other hand, some of them are telling the truth because some of us are really horrible people. But unless we change, and we said it before, until we change our condition, ourselves, Allah is not going to change the condition around us. We have to work on it. Brothers and sisters, if there was any important question that came up here tonight, that was the one single most important question because this deals with where do we go. When we walk out these doors, when you go anywhere after this, what are you going to say? What will you really remember about what we did tonight except for a couple of dumb jokes? What we, now seriously, what are you going to remember? When you walk out those doors, are you going to be the same person that walked in the door? Because if you are, then I wasted my time. And the organization here wasted their efforts and resources. But if you go out that door with a firm resolve and commitment to be a better Muslim, then inshallah, we achieve something here tonight. <laughs> and if somebody says to you when you walk out there, what was the lecture about? You say it's about 90 minutes, <laughs> then you missed the point. The point we really need to work on ourselves. We have such a beautiful list of questions, some of them very detailed. This one had to be on two sides, talking about leading the Israelites out of Egypt and the expression of only one God, the law. Mentioning here about the law, the Torah, the law or the Torah, 
How many of you heard about the Torah? Well, duh, it's in the Quran. I know you know it. But did you know that Sharia is the law for Muslims? But if I say in my country, what about the Sharia? <gasps> We're going to call Homeland Security. <laughs> but if I say, what about the Torah? Oh, that's good. Jewish law, good. Huh? They're both the same thing. Look at the Ten Commandments and look at Islam. Which one, do, where is there any difference? No difference. Except in Islam, it's even more clear. Because in the Bible, it just says, thou shalt not kill. Well, if you don't kill, you can't eat. Huh? I'm serious. Try to bite a chicken when he goes by. They don't like it. You have to kill him first. And you said, well, I won't eat meat at all. Well, you also can't kill plants. Because it just says, don't kill. What are you going to do? Eat the bark off a tree? So you have to kill. But Islam explains what you can't kill. And even when you kill, how to kill. Everything is clear in Islam. Details. And when it comes to murder, that's when it says, whoever takes an innocent life, it's like they killed all of humanity. It's forbidden for Muslims to kill anybody except those who are ordained to be killed because they are the mischief makers. That's a translation. The reality is these are people that are killing others. These are people who you can't deal with them anymore. And you're ordered to put them out of their misery before they cause more misery to everybody else. But this is a rare exception. And if somebody says, oh, I don't like Islam because you kill, well, what are you going to do about these people that are killing us? You just stand there and say, have a nice day. <laughs> and <laughs> why do you think the United States has a huge army, huh? To give out flowers? <laughs> so, we've got to keep a balance. Islam is truly about a balance. This we already answered just now. I, you know, I went wider than the question so we could answer more of them. Yeah, some, this is something, I have articles, uh, I hope that you'll write to me. Will you write to me and ask me and I'll show you where the links are that you can find. First go to linkstoislam.com and if you can't find an answer there, go to searchforislam.com. If you don't find an answer there, go to justaskislam.com. And if you still want to write to us, you can write to me at contact, C-O-N-T-A-C-T, -T, contact, at, you know at, the A with a circle, guideus.tv, or guide us TV, either way. I hope I'll guide you as too. And the rest of the questions that we've got here, some of these are, were, were not answered tonight. Some of them are very close to the ones we already just talked about. For sure, what I would like to do, I'm going to ask the brothers here to make a, all of these available to us so that we can put them on our website called islamnewsroom.com. Right now I have over 1,700 answers to questions over there that are turned into articles. More than 1,700 articles dealing with the common questions we have. How old was Aisha when she married Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa You better go read the article. You might be surprised. You might be very surprised when you read this article because of the details that we put in there and where the source is coming from. You might say this is the best love story I ever read in my life. I hope. I'll have another question. Why do Muslims have to beat their wives? Oh, wait till you read this one. You're going to be surprised. You'll be very surprised. It's not what you think. So many of the attacks against Islam, the misconceptions, are going to be answered in tomorrow's program. We're going to be dealing with that tomorrow. How many of you are going to be with us tomorrow? Anybody? Uh, B-Y-O-C B-Y-O-K B-Y-O-K you know what that stands for? 
bring your own cursey. Salam <laughs> alaikum.